Hello everyone and welcome to lecture 46 of this series on fluids, electrolytes, and acid-base disorders. This series of lectures is based on my book, Manual of Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. This is the book. It's available on uh, Amazon. Uh, currently, there is a, an ebook, there is a paperback, and now there is a hardcover also available of this book. You can uh, buy it by following the link below. Now, we are starting today with a new chapter, chapter 7, and it is on phosphate metabolism. We're going to discuss hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia. This lecture is an introduction to the subject. So phosphorus in the body is not going to be free phosphorus, of course. Um, it's going to exist as phosphate. Phosphate is very abundant. It's the most abundant intracellular anion. And most of it is organic phosphate, and these organic phosphate compounds are critical to cell function. Everyone is familiar with ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now, the phosphate homeostasis is regulated by the kidneys. And we have three hormonal systems here operating. So, the three hormonal systems regulating phosphate homeostasis are Number one, parathyroid hormone, like with calcium. Number two, fibroblast growth factor, 23, FGF, 23. And then 125-dihydroxyvitamin uh, D3 or calcitriol. So when we talked about calcium, we said the three systems responsible for calcium homeostasis are PTH, calcitriol, and serum calcium itself. So here, the uh, only difference is, well, serum calcium is not going to be with phosphate homeostasis. We have fibroblast growth factor 23 with clotho. We are going to talk about that more later, but keep these three systems in mind. Most cases of hypophosphatemia are acquired and are due to malnutrition, as you would see in alcoholism. The kidneys maintain phosphate level in the normal range. Therefore, we normally don't see hyperphosphatemia unless glomerular filtration rate is below 30. So you need to have stage usually 4 or 5 chronic kidney disease or someone on dialysis to see hyperphosphatemia. Now, hyperphosphatemia is therefore common in patients on renal replacement therapy, whether hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis. And how do we treat that? Well, we restrict phosphate in the diet and we use phosphate binders. What about organic versus inorganic phosphate? Uh, like I said, phosphorus is going to exist in the body as phosphate because phosphorus is highly reactive, okay? It's never found free in the body. In the, humo in the human body, phosphorus is bound to oxygen and usually it's a polyatomic ion phosphate, PO4, 3 minus. There are two forms of phosphate in the body, inorganic phosphate or mineral phosphate, again, inorganic or mineral, and then we have organic phosphate. Now, phosphate can be inside the cells or outside the cells. Now, most of the body phosphate is in the form of organic phosphate, and it is complexed with lipids, with carbohydrates, and also with protein. And like I said, phosphate is the most abundant intracellular anion, and the concentration inside the cell is 100 millimoles per liter. Okay, let's talk uh, for a second about intracellular phosphate. Most intracellular phosphate inside the cell is organic, and uh, everyone can uh, remember creatine phosphate, adenosine phosphate, erythrocyte 2,3-diphosphoglycerate, 2,3-DPG, and all these uh, elements, all these compounds are critical to all cell functions. Now, inorganic phosphate in the cell is sequestered within intracellular organelles and is complex with other ions such as calcium and magnesium. Now phosphate is essential to cellular structure, to the membrane structure, to the enzymatic processes such as glycolysis, 
and oxidative phosphorylation. Again, everyone knows about ATP. Again, remember adenosine triphosphate. Okay, what about phosphate in the serum? Serum phosphate assay is measurement of inorganic phosphate in the serum. So when you order serum phosphate or serum phosphorus, you are measuring inorganic, okay, inorganic or mineral phosphate in the serum. The normal range is 2.5 to 4.5 milligram per deciliter. If we are using millimoles, it's 0.8 to 1.45 millimole per liter. Now, we should never express phosphate as mill equivalent per liter. So either milligram per deciliter or millimole per liter. Now, if we want to convert from millimole per liter to milligram per deciliter, we need to multiply by 31, which is the atomic weight of phosphate, and then divide by 10, or simply multiply by 3.1, or if you want to do it quickly, just multiply by 3. It is important to emphasize that the serum phosphate, which is inorganic phosphate, mineral phosphate, is a very small fraction of the total body phosphate, only 0.3%. Now, most of the in inorganic phosphate in the serum exists as free phosphate, so 85%, only 10% is protein bound. We said with calcium, it's about like half and half. So a big portion of calcium is uh, bound to albumin. This is not the case with phosphate. So most of it is free, so we don't need to bother with the uh, ionized and, and such like we uh, talked about with calcium. So free phosphate is 85%, only 10% is protein bound, and 5% is complex with calcium, magnesium, or sodium. Now, serum inorganic phosphate has two forms, dihydrogen phosphate, H2PO4-, which is a weak acid, and then monohydrogen phosphate, HPO4- to negative or minus two, which is a weak base. At a physiologic pH, uh, we have a ratio of monohydrogen phosphate to dihydrogen phosphate of four to one. So you have four times more monohydrogen phosphate than dihydrogen phosphate. So you have more of the base phosphate than the acid phosphate, okay? So the, the, we said the dihydrogen phosphate is a weak acid and the monohydrogen phosphate is a weak base. Now, phosphate intake varies considerably among individuals and it really follows protein intake. If someone's protein intake is high, then their phosphate intake is going to be high. Now, things that are rich in phosphate, you have uh, dairy products, you have processed food. So the Average daily intake is anywhere between 700 to 2,000 milligrams per day. So you have a, like a really wide variations among individuals. Serum phosphate follows a circadian rhythm. The lowest level is around 11 a.m. The highest level is going to be in the afternoon. And the difference is about 0 0.6 milligram per deciliter. What about dietary phosphate? Most foods contain phosphate, especially protein-rich foods. So if you increase your protein intake, you're going to increase your phosphate intake. So seeds, legumes, fish, meat, and dairy products are all rich in phosphate. Now, dietary phosphate is derived either from animal sources or plant sources, animal protein or plant protein. Organic phosphate in animal protein is easily absorbed after hydrolysis, so you get most of it. While it, when it is in plant proteins such as beans, nuts, it is stored as phytate. Humans do not have the enzyme phytase. Therefore, the bioavailability of plant protein phosphate is less than 50%. Okay, so uh, the the phosphate with that comes with animal protein is almost completely uh, bioavailable. Now, food additives are an important source of inorganic phosphate in the diet, and it's 90% absorbed. And that can be easily overlooked because phosphorus or phosphate is not usually included in nutrition facts labels. Now, this has significant implications for people who need to restrict their phosphate, like people with advanced chronic kidney disease. Um, so it's, it'd be very hard to know if there is phosphate in certain food stuff, and therefore you need the help of uh, renal dietitians 
uh, to guide the patient through. Now, phosphorus is present in over 10% of medication formulations. Some medications are high in phosphorus, like amlodipine, lisinopril, cetagliptin, and paroxetine. These are common medications. The problem is you cannot make a broad recommendation because not all generic formulations have the same amount of phosphorus. The recommended daily allowance RDA of phosphorus in adults, and this is again measured as phosphorus, not phosphate, is 700 milligrams or 22.6 millimoles per day. This is equivalent to about 2,100 milligrams of phosphate, okay, if we are talking about phosphate. Most adults ingest significantly higher amount of phosphate, much higher than the 700 milligrams uh, minimum recommended, and that depends on their protein intake. Now, patients with chronic kidney disease are advised to ingest about a gram of phosphorus a day, 1,000 milligrams a day. We don't want to restrict more than that because that would lead to protein restriction and then malnutrition, which is worse than hyperphosphatemia. Okay, I'm going to end here, and in the next lecture, we'll talk about uh, phosphate homeostasis. See you then.